pretty much done with going back home. <laughs> um, and from that point, I knew very early on, that even within my master's degree, uh, that I didn't want a career in the city. Um, my friends at the time, I think, just kind of worked in music or in the creative industries, and I kind of felt as a personality inside, I didn't really fit in. But, um, but it was a great degree to do, but I wanted to put it and I managed to get through it pretty well. BBC as a brother, I'd always wanted to work for BBC, I'd always wanted to work in media, um, specifically in radio. Um, so, got positioned as a runner, worked unpaid for about three months, um, managed to get a job then in the finance department because of my maths degree, um, and really over the course of the next few years, um, just moved positions within the BBC to get closer into radio, um, ending up in the finance division of for Radio 1, Radio 2, and Radio 4. Um, and then the year 2000, the BBC were running a talent scheme. They were offering six traineeships to, um, it was actually offered to people who had never had any media experience, which I wasn't aware of at the time. So there was this big um, national kind of campaign to find six uh, trainees, basically. And I applied for that competition online, uh, went to the psychometric test, got through to the next stage, so it was radio show ideas. Um, got through to the next stage of an interview process, and at that stage, um, I met Andy Frank, who was control of Radio One at that time. Um, and he, it was only really at that point that, that he said he realised I was already working for BBC in the building around the corner, um, and, and had said they were actually looking for raw talent, as they called it. Um, so I didn't get that, and actually during that time, the department I was working in was being um, closed down. So we were, we were going to be made redundant, and that actually offered me a finance position in Radio 1, which is where I wanted to be ultimately. Um, but I actually turned that position down, only because I knew that if I'd moved, gone into that station as a finance assistant, I would never have been seen as anything else. So I turned it down, I was just about to think about what I was going to do next really, and I um, got a call from Andy Parker, maybe like two weeks after I went for my interview. Um, who called me back in, um, and there was a position that had become free in their operations department. Um, so he offered me the job there and then, um, and so I started a week later. So I got my position at Radio 1 in about 2000. Wow. Um, <laughs> and stayed, stayed there really for another year or so, and then I was selected to be part of the team of eight to set up uh, a launch one extra. Um, oh, which is wow. their digital black music station, yes. yeah, which was in 2002. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, so that was my first kind of real um, startup kind of experience. It was, it was brilliant. I mean, I was only an assistant at that time, but there was only eight people in the team. Um, and that was everything from, um, there was no brand, it was called Project Dex at the time, so there was no brand, um, no music policy, no DJs, no staff, no studios that needs to be built. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, to be able to be part of that experience from start to finish, um, oh, we launched it, I think it was August 2002. Um, so it's about an eight month period, um, and we went on recruitment tour around the UK to find DJs, to find staff, um, and yeah, it launched successfully um, in the end of 2002. So that was amazing. Um, and after that, I moved into just a regular production role at One Extra, um, which after they experienced the eight months, I kind of realised that's. That's kind of what I was looking for. I felt quite unchallenged in just a production role. Uh, I mean, I had a great time, did some great things, but in broadcasting the Trinidad Festival, uh, Carnival, sorry. Um, I worked for Rampage and, and you know, got, to go, you know, got to do a lot of live broadcasts. Yeah. So it, was, it was, had its really great moments. Uh, but ultimately, the day to day kind of studio role was just not something that was uh, motivating really to me. So um, I kind of decided to leave um, and I've had this idea for city socialising. So city socialising, um, I launched it eventually in January 2007. I left the BBC in about 18 months before that to uh, just set up a trial website. I really had noticed from the experience of my friends who moved to London in their late 20s, uh, my sister just moved to San Francisco with her job. Um, and they just found it really difficult to um, meet new people, basically, meet new friends. They kind of left a solid network of friends behind it, arrived in a new city um, and didn't really know where to start. They had um, people that worked to socialise with, and certainly at Radio yeah. 1, it was a very social place. But whereas for them, their, you know, their weekend would consist of us all going out for drinks on a Friday night. For me, that would be the beginning of my weekend. <laughs> and for them, that was their weekend. Yeah. And it took me quite a while to realise that. Cause I, I mean, having been in London since I was 18, I was, I, you know, throughout my 20s, I developed a really strong network of friends here. 
So I kind of took that, I think I took that very much for granted that, um, that everyone had that. So it was really that realisation. And, and certainly my sister moved to San Francisco. Um, she's a very sociable, outgoing, intelligent um, person. And she found it very difficult out there arriving uh, with no network in place. So it really came from that idea of um, trying to build a community, create a community for, for young professionals who are moving to cities to tap into, to meet groups of people, to be able to go out um, and explore their city with. So it was always. Uh, very much uh, about the offline focus, about going out and yeah. you know, I had a great time in London in my 20s yeah. <laughs> and it was really finding a way of how we can help replicate that for others coming in to recreate that feeling of going out with a group of friends for other people. I mean, one of the keys is preparation. I mean, before I even started raising investment, and actually the, the Series A round that we raised with Co-Founders Capital was the second time I'd raised investment. Oh, wow. So it's actually slightly easier the second time it's a, a slightly different ball game because um, the last round was a VC round so it's slightly uh, actually no it was actually slightly easier in a way actually, because the, fir the first round was in 2009 and it was actually um, a seed investment round that put together a syndicate of angel investors um, at the time it was October 2008 when I just started raising it was a terrible time economically everyone had lost their money certainly angels had lost a lot of their money so it was a bit of a struggle but I think the key was preparation, um, knowing what's going to be expected of you, understanding your business, being able to answer pretty much any question that's going to be thrown at you. So, um, yeah, preparation as to what, what it is that they're looking for. And different investors are going to have different appetites because you've got to understand what, what it is that they're looking for. You know, maybe angels may be looking for a much more solid investment, um, something that's going to generate the return. Um, more in the short term than the, long term, than the longer term, slightly more risk averse. Um, whereas for the, the VC round was a pitch really much much more on a, on a much bigger vision um, because their appetites are much bigger. They're not necessarily investing to get yeah. two to three times return. They're looking to get yeah. ten times return. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so I guess it's, it's who you're pitching to, and are you pitched to the right person, right people? Yeah. Do you understand what their motivations are? I think is as important um, as as. Um, it's just important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's one bit. But the other bit is just to really meet as many people as possible. I think at the time, both times actually, um, the first, the angel round, yeah. I signed up to two different programs. There's quite a few free programs out there, there's a few paid ones as well. Um, but there's a government scheme called the G2I Investment Program, uh, Investment Readiness Workshop, uh, which is a series of four um, one day workshops that was kind of prepare you. Um, for raising investment, yeah. so things like that are always really helpful. Um, they also introduce you to networks of, of investors before you kind of put yourself out there to really um, to practice, I guess, before you kind of get to the actual pitch. The incubators, there's so many ways it appears that yeah. you can get money, so many resources out there, um, a lot more support out there, it looks like, for people yeah. starting out, which is, which is amazing. Um, but it's but yeah, certainly it's, it's, it's about people at the end of the day as well. So I think if you can build enough of a network, personal relationships, yeah, and enough personal relationships, and before you kind of need the money, yeah. um, it's always helpful. I suppose like right when yeah. you need, because you, you know, you're looking at least at least five months um, from start to finish. Um, so it's always good to build those relationships early. Um, and I think so. For example, even now, even though you know, a plan and a desire for this year is to raise our next round and, and, and to raise our next round from the US and yeah. New York VC is, is our ambition. Um, but I'm already so we're already kind of stop reaching out now. I mean, we've had a few calls as well. And it's the same vice versa. They want to hear from you as well. Okay. Like really interesting business as well. Um, but it's one of those if you're going to get in touch with them and you say you're going to do something. And, you kind of re retouch, retouch base yeah. for them every three months. You kind of need to demonstrate you've kind of done what you said you were going to do, yeah. and in that way you're kind of building credibility before you get to the stage. Um, you actually need the investment is the plan. So. <laughs> so Uber Life is um, this is a totally separate product to City Socialising. Okay. Um, they're both in the online to offline space. So Uber Life is also about engaging with people offline using online tools to meet up and um, socialise more offline. Um, but Uber Life is a, for a, it's a it's a mobile app and an iPhone app. But we have a site as well, um, but it's a location-based uh, app um, dedicated to um, helping you hang out more with your own friends and network in the real world. Um, 
the idea is, is to encourage more frequent hanging out in the real world with your friends um, and making it as easy and quick as instant as, it, as we use online networks to connect. Um, so where City Social is very much more about meeting new people. Um, we're very, very early stages with it, so we're just okay. going to be releasing it as well doing a public sort of okay. sort of it um, next week. Okay. Um, so I'll kind of see how that goes, but it's it's totally free. Um, it's, it's an invite only network for now. Um, I mean, one of the difficulties is always finding the right people. I think is 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 difficult. Um, to find people who are basically work enough <laughs> is always weird and will work really, really hard because obviously yeah. the startup environment is, you know, it's, it's very stressful. Mm -hmm. You're working a lot of hours. Yeah. The pay isn't great because you're not necessarily, yeah. you know, you're spending more money than you're making. Finding people who can cope and thrive under those conditions and who are extremely talented, you know, they, they, <laughs> they can be hard to find. Um, so when you have them and if you want to keep them, um, so I think that's probably been and, and continues to be, and I think for everybody, continue will always be the greatest challenge is, is finding the right people to work with. Um, other challenges, you know, day to day, keeping on top of keeping the business afloat, really. You know, not spend more than you're making, um, um, using your resources as effectively as possible. Well, probably when I first actually launched. City socialising as yeah. officially in January 2007. For yeah. that, I spent 18 months, as I said, with a trial website, just um, really figuring out how it was going to work, and working with a developer just to kind of you know, enhance the product slightly. And then it kind of there was a kind of make or break period in um, at the end of 2006, where you know it was generating maybe a couple of thousand pounds a month yeah. or something like that. Um, and I was freelancing at the time in several areas to kind of support myself and to support the developments of the okay. site um, and it was really a crossroads at that point to decide whether I was going to just jack it in and get a mm -hmm. job or yeah. because I knew at that time I needed to completely over I needed a new product so I'd learned so much in 18 months yeah. so I kind of felt that would work um, and to turn it into a subscription model kind of very early on it was, kind of, it, was, it, was, it was quite a big risk because to do that I would need to raise £20,000 yeah. at that time which would have meant taking out a bank loan and, and looking for the money elsewhere. Um, so I kind of, and at that moment, I kind of, I did make the decision really to, and I knew at that point I had to commit to it full time. Mm. If I was going to make it work, I was going to do it. I had to really, really do it 100%. Um, so I decided to go down that road actually and then secure a bank loan. Um, I had to raise a little bit of friends and family investment. and. Um, and built what became City Socialising that we launched in January 2007. Not really knowing, you kind of put all my eggs in, into yeah. one basket, which is pretty, <laughs> quite scary at the time. Yeah. Um, but as soon as we had launched it, turned and switched on the new site, as it were, um, just the weeks and months that followed to see the subscription model like working straight away. Yeah. So like, within you know, a week, you know, our revenues had doubled and tripled, then quadrupled, and that was really, really it was exciting to see. Um, especially like the features that we've kind of integrated and and the little and the breakpoints we'd put in it, just from just from observing what had been going on and, and making a few kind of big guesses or kind of gut feel or kind yeah. of um, calls on how certain features would work and um, just to see that coming to life yeah. and suddenly <laughs> seeing enough money coming to support myself and then yeah. ultimately it helped us expand the yeah. business nationally without having to raise investment was was a, was a really gr was a great moment. It was, it was a moment yeah. I knew that I kind of I'd done the right thing for sure. You don't you don't need one. I mean as a co if I had to do it again yeah. I would definitely <laughs> buy one. But I mean but but I mean at the same time when I first went to university my first the degree, the degree I started out yeah. on was a computer science degree. I didn't last long on it, <laughs> but I, I went back to study just pure maths. Um, but I think coming from that, even from a sort of like a maths kind of background, there's certain elements that you kind of understand how the logic of how a lot of work, yeah. uh, a lot of things work. So although I'm not a, a coder myself, this I, I kind of I worked with a friend who was who was a developer, and I understood things. I picked things up quite quickly. Um, but I would definitely say absolutely yeah. It, it makes it makes well 
nowadays you can't <laughs> afford not to have a technical co-founder because you know to find someone who's good enough um, yeah they cost a lot of money good, good developers <laughs> as we all know so um, if you can definitely work if I had my next staff well in fact Uber Life yeah. I didn't start the project until I was a solid technical mm-hmm. board and after raising the credit cards investment in December 2010 I actually took about four months I didn't, we didn't do anything wow. until I about took four months to find that team and and I went as far as you know, moving someone over here from New York um, to wow. Dubai, head of product development. Um, <laughs> and he helped me recruit. He brought with him the team that he'd already worked with, who are you know, work remotely, but you know, top class developers. Yeah. Um, and without them, we certainly wouldn't be able to be operating at the level and, and produce it at the site as, as, as amazing as it was. <laughs> um, so I'm really, really proud of that. And you know, hopefully now the next phases will be to rebuild and socialising onto the new platform. Like, to redesign it to give it the same kind of love, care, yeah. attention, sort of talent, talent working on it. So, yeah, no, definitely. I think these days, particularly, I think with with the level of quality there is with with sites and social networks around, yeah. anything that's less than beautiful, amazing, <laughs> yeah. is going to find it really difficult to cut through because people are just used to Apple. Apple, <laughs> absolutely. Well, no, you're yeah. exactly right. So, you know, so the, so the bar's been raised. Yeah. So absolutely, I think now there's no way I'd be able to get away with what I'd got yeah, away with before, back in yeah. 2008 there's no way we'd be able to get away with the same again so it was, it was time to move to Old Street certainly in terms of the community that's been, yeah. that's been building here for a little while um, past three years we've been facing London Bridge and I think even three years ago there wasn't so much of a community yeah. there wasn't Silicon Roundabout didn't yeah. really exist um, and I think certainly after raising pro founders investment with Uber Life, it just felt like a natural place to be. And I think the more people I knew got along with were moving here. Yeah. Now, I mean, we've only been here for like two months, but it's been amazing already. So it's just so much easier. Like I said, I've had like two meetings with um, you know, a music um, agency, a branding agency as well, just to see if there's ways to collaborate. Yeah. And all the guys here, like you know, Last Affair, SoundCloud, SoundCloud and, and you know, Songkick as well. We were you know, at Willie Inn yesterday. And, you know, it's just great to be here, being so close to your peers as well. It's, it's, a, it's, it's really refreshing actually as well, kind of to be able to go to these like, informal kind of networking yeah. events and just kind of just hang out and kind of just talk about what you're up to. And, um, is really actually unique. It's really really nice. Um, something we never had before in London Bridge yeah. that I'm definitely sort of making the most of right now. So I think it's just that peer support, that peer network. Um, I think is, and, and yeah, learning from each other is is, is invaluable. I think. Well, I'll be passionate, I guess. I think that's, that's, <laughs> that's the only thing that's going to really get you through, I think, because no one really does it for love or money. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so be passionate, stay focused, um, try and set yourself some real milestones and st- try and stick to them. It's really easy to drift for a long time. Um, but, you know, time moves so quickly as well <laughs> that you kind of, you know, you kind of need to set, you'd be quite disciplined, I think, yeah. to just set yourself... Um, targets of where you want to be uh, in three months and six months uh, maybe in, uh, three months is kind of yeah. good enough actually quarterly because things change all the time um, but really stick to those they have a discipline to stick to those I mean if you haven't got the one thing one good thing about having investors on board is that once you have a board you have other people yeah <laughs> you know, which has its high points and its yeah. low points as well um, but I think particularly when you're on your own, yes, it's, it's being disciplined enough to set yourself targets, set yourself goals, and do whatever it takes <laughs> to hit them, even if you haven't got someone breathing down your yeah. neck. But, yeah, I mean, nine times out of ten, you know, there's a resource issue, so you're, you're going to motivate you anyway, because yeah. you kind of have to so either sink or swim. Um, so, yeah, just really to be disciplined, set yourself milestones, stay passionate, really, mm-hmm. and, um, and meet as many people as you can. I think that's, because as I said, the, the, yeah. the key to, I think, any success is people and the relationships that you have. Um, you could be the you know, best coder in the world, or you could be the best designer in the world, or you could be the best whatever in the world, but unless you find um, the right people, the right network, and the right team to collaborate with, and, um, and just to share more rooms and more stories yeah. with, um, you know, to try and get yourself out there as much as possible, which is difficult in the early days, because you're just kind of working solidly, but definitely, you know, it definitely helps to get yourself out there and kind of 